first word came at about 1.40 p.m. Eastern time. It happened too quickly for cameras to be in place. And I gave it a great deal of thought, Grandpa. Here is a bulletin from CBS News. In Dallas, Texas, three shots were fired at President Kennedy's motorcade in downtown Dallas. The first reports say that President Kennedy has been seriously wounded by this shooting. Then it was back to the soap opera, but not for long. Soon after, Walter Cronkite was back, reporting from the CBS newsroom, complete with rotary telephones and wire machines. This picture has just been transmitted by wire. It is a picture taken just a moment or two before the incident. If you can zoom in with that camera, we can get a closer look at this picture. On November 22nd, 1963, the assassination of John F. Kennedy will be an event that goes down in America's history. A more recent event, 9-11, is also an event that is questioned by many Americans as to its true legitimacy, and many questions linger about that day, which will go down in infamy. One thing is for sure, though, the government is working around the clock to ensure that one day, Americans will be subjected to a new world order. After World War II, the United Nations was set up as a beacon toward the setup of a new world order. As we look back on September 11, 2001, we see that there are many unanswered questions. But since that day, we do know that the government is trying their hardest to ensure that Americans would give up their freedom for security. And as many patriots have once said, the American that is willing to give up their freedom for security deserves neither. One thing we see in America today is that we are moving toward a cashless society where instead of using cash, we're looking toward more electronic means of making financial transactions. The King James Bible teaches that one day everyone in the world will be required to take a mark that will either be in their right hand or in their forehead. And this mark must be used to buy or sell and without it you will not be able to. We are already seeing this technology go into place today. Many Americans when they go to the store they will use their credit card that has an embedded RFID chip and everything will take place electronically and cash is becoming a thing of the past. Would it really be that hard to institute this as some sort of chip that could go inside your right hand or inside your forehead that without it you would not be able to buy or sell? These days are not far off. Many Christians today understand that these days are going to come. But there is an idea out there known as the pre-tribulation rapture, which was taught by John Nelson Darby, the modern day father of dispensationalism. go forward to defend freedom and all that is good and just in our world. Current productions have been out to refute this doctrine of the pre-tribulation rapture, taught at first by John Nelson Darby, and has gained widespread attention. However, popular religious leaders, such as the Pope of the Catholic Church or other religious leaders of the Christian community, still continue to teach this pre-tribulation rapture doctrine. And because of this, Christians are not ready to face the coming tribulation that the Bible teaches. Sometimes I'm criticized in my own country for professing a belief in international norms and multilateral institutions. But I am convinced that in the long run, giving up some freedom of action, binding ourselves to international rules over the 
long-term enhances our security. We have before us the opportunity to forge for ourselves and for future generations a new world order, a world where the rule of law, not the law of the jungle, governs the conduct of nations. The affirmative task we have now is, uh, is to actually um, uh, create uh, uh, a new world order. A world in which there is the very real prospect of a new world order. It's about the future of Europe and a new world order. A new world is emerging. It is a new world order with significantly different and radically new This is After the Tribulation, Revisited. My name is Stephen Anderson. I'm the pastor of Faithful Word Baptist Church in Tempe, Arizona. And I'm on a mission to educate people about the pre-tribulation rapture because it's a position that's based upon ignorance. And I just believe that if people would see the scriptures and see the facts, it wouldn't be hard for them to come to the conclusion that the rapture definitely comes after the tribulation. My name is Roger Jimenez. I'm the pastor at Verity Baptist Church in Sacramento, California. I grew up in a Christian home and I was taught the pre-tribulation rapture my whole life. And I never had a reason to question it. Preachers told us that and I just took it for what it was worth. But as I was exposed to that doctrine, I began to see just how unscriptural it really is, and I just feel that we need to teach the Bible and get the truth out there. My name is Matthew Boer, and I am an evangelist. Growing up, I grew up in a Christian household, and I was always taught the pre-tribulation rapture, and I really had no reason at the time to think that it was a false rapture idea. But what I come to realize later on when I decided to take the Bible as my final authority is that contrary to other doctors of the Bible where I would go to the Bible itself to determine what I believe about certain things, the pre-tribulation rapture idea did not come to me through the Bible, but rather a commentary that someone else had written, which is obviously not God's word. And I noticed later on when I decided to take the Bible as the final authority toward everything that I believe, that the pre-tribulation rapture is not mentioned in there if you look at the very clear scriptures that exist in the Bible. And you'd have to go through a game of mental gymnastics to really determined that the rapture would be before the tribulation. And I really decided that if Christians don't realize that the rapture is actually after the tribulation, when the tribulation time comes, they won't be prepared. And I feel it's best that myself, as well as every other Christian out there, knows what the Bible teaches on this subject through its very clear scriptures throughout the Bible, and that they can be prepared for what's to come. Kent Hovind is also a popular name and household name amongst independent Baptists and other Bible-believing Christians. And fortunately, we were able to also contact him regarding his stance on the rapture and its position. Kent Hovind also has a conversion testimony about how he used to be a preacher of rapture believer and how he recently converted to the post-tribulation pre-wrath rapture position. My name is Ken Hovind. I was a high school science teacher 15 years and then became an evangelist for 20 years teaching on creation and evolution. And then I've been really concerned about my view of the end times and how it fit together with scripture. And I became convinced, oh, about three years ago that what I've been taught all my life is not true. Um, so I, I had to switch to what's called the post-trib pre-wrath position about three years ago, and it just, everything is clicking together in Scripture so well. It's just, it fits. It's like a big Sudoku puzzle. I've been trying to force the nine into the corner for all these years, and you know, the six goes in the corner. You know, it just, well, nothing else works unless you get it right. I have had to switch, uh, much to the dismay of many of my uh, fundamental brethren, to the uh, Pre-tribulation rapture doctrine is pretty new. There's no evidence of anyone teaching it before 1830. We've got to understand that the 1830s is pretty late in history. I mean, for thousands of years from the time of Christ, we went through the Reformation, we went through all sorts of theologians, you know, whatever you, you do or don't agree with men like Martin Luther, or John Calvin, or whatever it is, the fact is that thousands of books, thousands of papers, thousands of essays, and uh, a whole lot of preaching had been done before 1830. And I'm talking, there's no evidence of anyone from any denomination, any type of Christianity, that taught this doctrine. When you look at the historical account, you've, you've got to ask yourself the question, what are the roots of the pre-tribulation rapture? One of the early proponents of pre-tribulationism 
was a man by the name of John Nelson Darby. In the 1830s, he began to teach the doctrine of what he called the secret rapture. He would later produce his own translation of the Bible, from which he removed entire verses, corrupted important biblical doctrines, and tampered with key passages concerning the second coming of Jesus Christ. John Nelson Darby, known as the father of modern dispensationalism, promoted his theory of a pre-tribulation rapture throughout the 19th century. Later, the pre-tribulation rapture gained widespread acceptance among Baptists when Oxford University Press published the Schofield Reference Bible, which contained marginal notes promoting the concept of Darby's secret rapture. These notes have caused many Christians to embrace this doctrine as though God has said it himself. The devil has used this tool of the Schofield reference system of the Bible more than anything to promote this doctrine of the pre-trib rapture. You want to know where it comes from? This is how it got into churches. This is where pastors are getting it. This is where it's coming. It ain't coming from the Bible. It sure didn't come from the mouth of Jesus Christ, but it came from the mouth of Schofield. And so Schofield's notes point to a pre-tribulation rapture and they lead the reader to believe that it's in scripture when it's really not there at all. And so because of the Schofield Bible being sent out to so many seminaries and colleges and, and so many young preacher boys reading the Schofield Reference Bible, they started to just take the pre-tribulation rapture as fact and started preaching it. And then later on, it was picked up by a guy named Schofield. And this guy Schofield put out a Schofield Reference Bible and that is what is responsible for uh, getting it to all the Baptists. All the seminaries started really pushing the Schofield Reference Bible. I just got a call this week of people trying to sell me Schofield Bibles. And so the Schofield Bible is all about getting the pre-trib rapture doctrine out to people. One question I get asked considerably is where did the pre-tribulation rapture even come from? And really most of it came from a man named John Nelson Darby. Now. The first thing you need to know about John Nelson Darby is that this man is not a man of God and he's probably one of the most wicked people that are ever around. Most people don't realize that John Nelson Darby tried writing his own translation of the Bible. Now the first thing that you really need to know is that whenever someone claims that they are able to write the, the Bible better than what the Bible says already, that's someone that you probably should get as far away from as possible. Okay. John Nelson Darby wrote the Darby translation of the Bible, which makes many changes and makes the blood of Jesus and other crucial doctrines to the Christian faith of none effect. Now, the King James Bible says in Revelation chapter 22, verse 18, it says, For I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book, if any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. And verse 19 goes on to say, And if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things which are written in this book. So God's being pretty serious here when he says, Don't make any translations to my word. And that is exactly what John Nelson Darby did. A couple examples in particular is 1 John 5, 7. If you were to turn there in the Darby translation, it's not there. He took it out. That's one verse that proves the Trinity and the deity of Christ. Also, another verse that is tampered with is Romans 1.16. Instead of saying, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, all it says is, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, period. And that's it. And the problem with that is, is that John Nelson Darby is trying to hint at the idea that there's another gospel out there that doesn't include Jesus. And that is highly blasphemous. And according to what Revelation 22 says, John Nelson Darby is damned, unfortunately. And, you know, there, there are countless other places in the Bible. For example, in Luke chapter 2, verse 33, where the King James Bible is very clear in making it out that Joseph is not the father of Jesus because Jesus is the son of God. Darby, in his translation of the Bible, decided to say that Joseph was indeed the father of Jesus, trying to say that Jesus was not the son of God. So Darby damns himself writing that book. And what you'll see is that when a false teacher comes in and he tries to spread these doctrines like this, he doesn't have any righteousness inside of him. And what happened is his disciple, C.I. Schofield, he came around and now he has a reference Bible that many independent fundamental Baptists are using. And instead of actually reading the Word of God, 
what they're getting is just Schofield's notes. And what you get is, you get the pre-tribulation rapture, you get the idea known as dispensationalism, and you get Zionism as well. All three of them kind of come together, and none of them are found in the Bible anywhere. I can't believe today that the Baptists will call themselves a dispensationalist today when dispensationalism was started by the biggest Satanist, John Nelson Darby, in the 1800s. Okay, who's ever heard of the Darby translation of the Bible? Okay, I, I pulled it out last night. I looked at it just, just to do a little research on it. I opened up the, the Darby translation. You know what it said in 1 John 5, 7? Nothing, because it wasn't there. You know what it said in Acts 8, 37? Nothing. And this is before all the new versions came out. This is back in the 1800s. I, I, I flipped open to Luke 2.33 in the Darby translation. It said, his father and mother marveled. Speaking of Joseph as Jesus' father. I flipped over to a, a, another scripture, Colossians 1.14. In whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, through his blood was removed from this translation. So here's a guy who who completely altered and chopped up and messed up the Bible back in the 1800s. So according to the Bible, if you remove something from God's Word in Revelation 22, He says, your part is blotted out of the book of life. And He said, if you add anything to these words, He said, I'll add unto you the plagues that are written in this book. And so according to the Bible, John Nelson Darby is in hell. Okay? He's a false teacher. And that wasn't even all the false teaching He did. But here's a guy who just attacked and... and and, and put out a phony Bible. He attacked the true word of God and tampered with it. And then his disciple, you know, C.I. Schofield, who says in the very front of the Schofield Bible, right in the front of the introduction, he says that the King James Bible is filled with mistakes and that the revised version is better. He said, the only reason I'm using the King James Version for this study Bible is because it's the most popular. And so that's why I've corrected it for you in the column where I've changed what it says and tell you what it really means. Okay, these guys were, were evil men. Not, not uh, Schofield was not a Baptist. Believed in this universal church doctrine. So did Darby. They're, they're false teachers, and yet they're the ones who gave us all our modern dispensationalism, Zionism, pre-tribulation rapture, all this false teaching. We need to get back to the Bible. So where's everybody getting well, this? I mean, this they're not reading, reading the Bible. They're not reading the Bible. They're just listening to preaching. I believe in a pre-tribulation rapture. Some people think it happens at the end of the tribulation or near the end of the tribulation. I think it happens at the beginning. So anybody tells you that the church, which is us, we go into the tribulation, they don't know their Bible. I'm not going through any of the tribulation. Now, for centuries, if not millennia, the church as a whole has believed in a pre-tribulation rapture. That is that the rapture takes place first before anything takes place in the tribulation. See, most Christians, they show up at church and listen to preaching, but they don't read the Bible on their own throughout the week. Second Peter chapter 3, uh, the Bible says the scoffers in the last days would be willingly ignorant of the creation, the flood, and the coming judgment. Well, I spent 20 years teaching all over the world about the creation and the flood, but I kind of avoided the coming judgment part because I didn't understand it myself. I had read probably a hundred books and seen all the videos left behind. And, uh, you know, uh, Kirk Cameron's a good friend of mine. He started the series. And, and I heard Salem Curvan and Jack Hiles and John Rice. And I read so many books by the fundamental brethren teaching the pre-trib. And I just believed it without searching it out. I shouldn't have done that, but I did. Now, because this doctrine is not found in the Bible at all, there's no clear scripture that anybody can point to that shows you, here's where it says before the tribulation, Jesus comes in the clouds. They have to rely on a lot of fear and intimidation to make sure that all the preachers walk in line. Now, just in my own personal life, I started pastoring seven years ago, and I was sent out to start an independent Baptist church in Phoenix, Arizona. The church that sent me out, as soon as they found out that I did not believe in the pre-tribulation rapture, because I preached a sermon, you know, where I explained why it was false, they immediately cut all ties with me, cut all contact with me, disowned me effectively, and honestly, any pastor who preaches against the pre-tribulation rapture is gonna pay a big price. They're gonna lose their preacher friends. They're gonna lose any kind of funding because if you are not pre-trib, you are not in the club. And they have to rely on that blackballing of anybody who will question it in order to make sure that every Baptist and every evangelical is in lockstep 
uh, teaching the preacher of rapture. Let me tell you something. Every single Baptist Bible college or Baptist seminary or evangelical uh, Bible college that I know of teaches the pre-tribulation rapture, and they demand that their graduates believe. And they even have Hollywood movies where the aliens come and take the good people away. Even, I mean, the Hollywood's pushing this. One doctrine that I think Christians can really take, even if they're not even thinking about the rapture, is that God is not the author of confusion. So if a Christian believes that they need another teacher to teach them the Bible, and they need all these help texts and other references, chances are what they're being taught is a false doctrine. Anything that you read in the Bible is always read plainly, and the issue of the rapture is no different. The Bible makes very clear mentions in all four Gospels that the rapture happens after the tribulation. Now, it's not specifically written in the book of John, as it is in the book of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, but it is written in the book of Revelation. So yes, all four Gospel writers did write about it, and in each book you'll see that it's very clear. Anyone who would just read it with an open mind would know that, hey, this is talking about the rapture and that it is indeed after the tribulation. So in Revelation chapter 6, uh, at the end of Revelation chapter 6, verse 12, you have the sixth seal open and it says, And I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood, and the stars of heaven fell unto the earth, even as a fig tree casteth her untimely figs, when she is shaken of a mighty wind. And the heaven departed as a scroll when it is rolled together, and every mountain and island were moved out of their places, and it explains to us when the sixth seal happens, the, these, this phenomenon happens in heaven where the, the sun becomes black as sackcloth of, as, uh, of hair, the moon becomes as blood, and, and that's found for us in the Olivet Discourse as well. In Matthew 24, it says the same terminology, and it tells us in verse 29, immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened and the moon shall not give her light and the stars shall fall from heaven and the powers of heaven shall be shaken just like it did in Revelation chapter 6, the sixth seal. But, and then in verse 30 it says, and then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory and he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to another. So there we find a reference to the rapture and it happens after the sun is darkened the moon doesn't give her light just like it does in, in revelation chapter 6 mark 13 luke 21 teach the exact same event and the interesting thing in revelation is that you end chapter 6 with the darkening of the sun and all those things and then in chapter 7 you find the rapture just like you do in matthew 24 mark 13 luke 21. all these texts in the bible that teach us about prophecy are all going in the same chronological order and there is a sign of his coming that's the answer he gave to his disciples he says the sign is when you see the sun darken the moon not give its light it says you know the rapture's coming in matthew 24 i think the key event that we need to watch for is find everything up it's just like this is the key to the sonoma puzzle it's the sun and the moon going dark right the sun and the moon going dark is mentioned at least 12 times in scripture so i went back and searched and found them all all that i could find anyway the first one's in isaiah chapter 13 verse 10 it talks about the sun and the moon going dark and it talks about it in Ezekiel 32 7, and Joel mentions it four times uh, Joel 2 2, 2 10, 2 31, and 3 15. Amos they possibly mentions it in Amos 8 9, but in Matthew 24, it just could not be more clear. Now, most Christians understand that the book of Revelation is a book on Bible prophecy, and many Christians have turned there for years to think about what's going to happen in the future here on earth. And the book of Revelation in chapter 6 does talk about these events that will happen during the time of the rapture. And if we see in verse number 12 of Revelation chapter 6, it says, And I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood. And the stars of heaven fell unto the earth, even as a fig tree casteth her untimely figs, when she is shaken of a mighty wind. And the heaven departed as a scroll when it is rolled together, and every mountain and island were moved out of their places. So we see key elements of the rapture here. First off, we see the sun and the moon are going dark, and then after this we see the stars start to fall from heaven, and then we see Jesus coming in the clouds. Now, these same events are taking place 
in Luke chapter 21, which talks about the same thing. It's a parallel passage. Luke chapter 21, beginning in verse number 25, we have the same elements. It says, And there shall be signs in the sun, and in the moon, and in the stars, and upon the earth distress of nations with perplexity, the sea, and the waves roaring, men's hearts failing them for fear, and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth. For the powers of heaven shall be shaken, and then they shall see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. And when these things begin to come to pass, then look up and lift up your heads, for your redemption draweth nigh. So just like in the book of Revelation, we see these same exact events taking place in the book of Luke in this parallel passage. We see the sun and the moon having events taking place. In this case, it's the sun and moon going dark. We have events taking place with the stars. In this case, just like we read in Revelation, it's the stars falling from heaven. And then we see Christ coming in the clouds. So when we're looking to see when the rapture is going to take place, although we don't know what time this is going to happen, we do understand that it says, and just like it says in Matthew 24 and Mark 13, it says, after the tribulation, we'll have the sun and moon going dark, and then we'll have stars falling from heaven, and then we'll have Jesus coming in the clouds. We're being caught up to meet him in the air, okay? Now, keeping those elements in mind, go back to Matthew 24 and see the exact same elements in Matthew 24, 29 through 31. It says in Matthew 24, 29, immediately after the tribulation. And sometimes I want to just ask people, what part of after do you not understand about this passage? But it says, immediately after the tribulation of those days, shall the sun be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. Then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. And then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man. The Son of Man was something that Jesus called himself while he was on this earth. He said, they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet. And they shall gather together his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. All the same elements. Jesus is coming in the clouds. A trumpet sounds. He sends the angels to gather his elect. Now, if you would, keep your finger there and just go to Mark 13. Now, Mark 13 pretty much says all the same things that Matthew 24 says. It's what the, we would call a parallel passage. You find the same preaching, the same teaching in these two chapters. Uh, you could put them side by side. They say the same things. Uh, let me just show it to you in that passage. It says in verse 24, but in those days... After that tribulation, the sun shall be darkened and the moon shall not give her light and the stars of heaven shall fall and the powers that are in heaven shall be shaken. And then shall they see the son of man coming in the clouds with great power and glory. And then shall he send his angels and shall gather together his elect from the four winds from the uttermost part of the earth to the uttermost part of heaven. Now, at this point, we could just pray and go home. We should just be able to just close our Bible and say, there you have it, folks. It's after the tribulation. Just close our Bibles and go home. But oh no, we're not going to close our Bibles and go home. Because I'm going to prove to you and, and show you this is talking about the rapture. And this says it's after the tribulation. The, the pre-tribulation rapture is not based on any scripture. There's no scripture that says before the tribulation. It only says after the tribulation. Well, and if, if we, unfortunately, if we are here during that time, I mean, uh, this could be a dark hour for, for Christians. I mean, it's oh, not yeah. going to be a picnic. Right? Well, it's going to be a dark hour for everybody, mm -hmm. but it's especially going to be a dark hour toward the end for Christians because, you know, the events of the tribulation, obviously, it, it all starts out with warfare on a global scale, that, which leads to famines. There's going to be disease. There's going to be natural disasters. But then when the real great tribulation begins, it, it, it's characterized by Christians being killed for the cause of Christ, being beheaded, because frankly, they are not going to get on board with the Antichrist's world government, and, and they're not going to get on board with the one world religion. So the Bible here we see in, in all the chapters, in Matthew chapter 24, Mark chapter 13, Luke chapter 21, and Revelation chapter 6, we see in all four chapters that the Bible paints a very gloomy picture of what this tribulation is going to be like. And if Christ is going to come in the clouds after that period when the sun and moon go dark, 
there's going to be a very gloomy time for Christians that are living during that time. Now, something I've noticed is that when Christians find something in the Bible that they find unpleasant, Christians will do whatever they can to take that doctrine and make it not apply to them. They'll find some excuse to say that the doctrine has already come to pass or it's something that won't apply to them. And the first thing that I hear is that uh, the claim they make is that Matthew 24 applies specifically to the Jews. Now, that is actually a false teaching. And when Christians say that Matthew 24 applies to the Jews and it doesn't apply to believers today, is that you'll see a rise of Zionism and you'll see a rise of dispensationalism, which is started by the same guy, John Nelson Darby. And that's where it came from. And if you're going to accept one of these doctrines, such as the pre-tribulation rapture, you're going to accept Zionism and you're going to accept the other doctrine as well. Which is why you always see so much of that today. Because if you have so much of the pre-trib rapture being taught, you have so much of these other false doctrines as well. Israel's fight is our fight. We are one. We are united. We will not be discouraged. We will not be defeated. We will not be intimidated. We will not sit down. We will not be silent. We are the worst nightmare of the anti-Semites of the world. The victory is going to be ours. If you will not stand with Israel and the Jews, then I will not stand with you. Thank you and God bless you. No, we stand with the people of Israel. I am asking you to join with me and every Christian and every Jew and every freedom-loving American to demand that this president and Congress do whatever is necessary to eradicate the evil of ISIS and radical Islam from the face of the earth. It is time to act now. And I will bless them that bless you and curse him that curses you. Uh, you don't want to be an enemy and of Israel. And you shall all families of the earth be blessed. Yes, amen. You're either for or against her. You're one of the two. The man, the church, the nation that blesses the state of Israel, the Jewish people, will be blessed beyond measure. Blessing Israel doesn't just mean, so, well, I bless you. Yeah. You have to stand with them in the route of need. Mm -hmm. Whenever I show people Matthew 24, it seems like their knee-jerk reaction is to say, oh, that's talking to the Jews, you know. Have you had people hit you with that? I have. I had a guy email me just yesterday, three times. So it was pretty upset. He said, look, Matthew, it's for the Jews. I, I photocopied uh, the pages for Matthew 24, Mark 13, and Luke 21, cut them into strips so they would fit side by side, and then drew lines connecting things that are obviously talking about the same thing. Like, they all start off with the same question, the when and the, and the uh, where, and how are we going to know? What's the sign? Well, the sign of his coming, quite obviously, is the sun and the moon going dark. Right. The sign. And there's at least 12, possibly 13 references in the Bible to the sun and the moon going dark. That is not going to be something that anybody's going to miss. The whole world is going to spot that. A lot of people will attack this chapter and say this. You can't get your doctrine on this from Matthew 24 because Matthew 24 is only talking to the Jews. They'll just write this passage off and say, oh, this is only for the Jews. So everything that Jesus is speaking and preaching before he died, he is a Jew preaching to Jews. You know what that means? That means Matthew 24 is written to Jews. Why would Jesus be telling us to watch out for something that we never have to watch out for? Well, that then it must be he's not talking to us. Well, who is he talking to? Jews. And some scholar somewhere decided that the book of Matthew is to the Jews, the book of Mark is to the Romans, the book of Luke is to the Greeks, and the book of John is to the world. Well, thank you, God, for including us in at least one of the four Gospels. But who comes up with this stuff? Now look, Maybe Matthew is geared toward the Jews. Maybe Luke is geared toward the Greeks. Maybe the epistle of Paul to the Ephesians was geared toward the Ephesians. Do you think? Maybe the epistle of Paul to the Hebrews was geared toward the Hebrews. Maybe the epistle of Paul to the Thessalonians was geared toward the Thessalonians. But every promise in the book is mine. Every chapter, every verse, every line. The book of Titus wasn't just for Titus. That was a short-lived book. It's for every pastor to read for every believer to read. It's, it's the New Testament. But here's what they say, no, 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 Pastor Anderson, you don't get it. 
This whole sermon was preached about the Jews, to the Jews, for the Jews. Jesus Christ, they say, was preaching to the Jews in the Olivet Discourse. That's the fancy theological name they gave to this passage. Matthew 24, Mark 13, they call it the Olivet Discourse. Pastor Anderson, he was talking to the Jews. Don't you get it? When he said in Mark 13, 24, after the tribulation, after that tribulation, and then he talked about Jesus coming in the clouds in verse 26 and gathering the elect in verse 27 from the uttermost part of the earth to the uttermost part of heaven. He said, they say, that's just talking to the Jews only. Okay, look at the last verse of Mark 13. Mark 13, 37. And what I say unto you, I'm only saying to the Jews. Don't let any preacher try to tell you this is for all believers. It's only for the Jews. Is that what it says in Mark 13, 37? No, it says, and what I say unto you, I say unto all. Watch. That's the last word of the chapter. What I say unto you, I say unto all. Watch. And yet people will still turn around and say, this chapter is not talking to all. It's only talking to the Jews. It's almost like he knew that people would say that. And so he just says it at the end. I'm not just talking to you. I'm talking to all when I say watch. This is for everybody. And so to say that this chapter is only talking to the Jews is ridiculous when he flat out says, what I say unto you, I say unto all, watch. Oftentimes people will look at Matthew 24, verses 30 and 31, and they'll say, well, even though it looks like the rapture, and even though it sounds like the rapture, it's not the rapture. And here's the reason they'll say it's not the rapture. If you look at verse 31, it says, And he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect. And people will look at that word and they'll say, well, see there, the word elect is not Christians. They'll say the elect is Israel. So therefore, Matthew 24 is not the rapture, is not meant for Christians. This whole chapter is meant for the Jews because he's talking about the elect. But he, the issue with that is this. We must always allow the Bible to be its own dictionary. So if you just let the Bible speak for itself, what you'll notice is that the elect is actually not referring to Israel. But the question you always have to ask yourself right away then, if the Bible can just be its own dictionary, is where do people get this idea that um, Israel mentioned in the Bible is talking to the Jews? Well, just like we were talking about earlier, it comes from C.I. Schofield and the study Bible that he had published. Although it's not found in the main text anywhere, the Word of God, it's found in Schofield's notes. And this doctrine hasn't been taught for a long time. This is a new doctrine that was brought up by C.I. Schofield. And just like I told you earlier, C.I. Schofield, when you bring up the pre-tribulation rapture, you bring up Zionism, and you bring up dispensationalism. All three of those come together and essentially are one and the same. Yeah, they, they'll, they'll take that word elect and they'll try to say, well, the elect, that's the Jews, the chosen ones. What about that? Have you heard that one? Oh, yeah. You know, back before the late 1800s, everybody recognized what we're talking about now. But something began to change. First with Dr. Uh, you know, Cyrus Schofield. C.I. Schofield was a divorced man. He had trouble with alcohol. He was a lawyer turned preacher. He left his first wife, Leontine Sierre, in 1883. That's the year after he wrote his first book, Rightly Dividing the Word of Truth. So in 1882, he writes his first book, Rightly Dividing the Word of Truth. 1883, he leaves his first wife, marries another lady, and then becomes a pastor in Texas. Very famous, very popular. Schofield's Dispensational Premillennial Bible was edited with financial assistance from prominent businessmen, some of which had questionable religious ties. And he had Jewish retainers who made him a member of a club called the Lotus Club, a, a sort of a secret society. And uh, suddenly he had plenty of money. This corrupt lawyer who had abandoned his wife and was found guilty of numerous offenses as, as a corrupt attorney. But Schofield was given money and the Oxford group out of England published his Bible. Why would they take a crooked lawyer and make him the editor of a Bible? And then suddenly they had millions of dollars to promote it. With that amount of money, then the Bible took off. And it, it basically sealed the deal for the Jews. The Schofield Reference Bible is very pro-Israel, very Zionist. And this book, more than any other book, changed the thinking of an entire generation of young preacher boys. Now, I'm always hearing the pre-tribulation rapture and Zionism and dispensationalism always being grouped together because it really seems that they're one and the same. 
one of the largest things I hear is that Matthew 24 is specifically to the Jews. But hold on a second now. Jesus wasn't talking to the Jews. He was talking to his disciples. And if you remember, one of his disciples was Simon the Canaanite. Now hold on. Canaanites are not Jews. So Jesus was talking to his disciples in Matthew chapter 24, and Simon the Canaanite was one of his disciples. Jesus isn't talking to Jews. Now many people will try to discount this passage or cast aside this passage by saying, well this passage is only talking to the Jews. Now, as far as I'm concerned, every promise in the book is mine, every chapter, every verse, every line. This isn't talking to the Jews, he's talking to his disciples. And did you know that one of his disciples was named Simon the Canaanite? Here's a hint. Canaanites aren't Jews, okay? And if you read Mark chapter 13, verse 37, which is another account of the same events, you'll see that Jesus says, What I say unto you, I say unto all. Watch. So Jesus wasn't just specifically talking to the Jews. He was talking to everybody. He said, What I say unto you, I say unto all. The reason people believe that the word elect is talking about Jews or talking about Israel is because instead of studying the Bible and instead of reading the Bible, they've been reading commentaries and they've been reading books written by men and those men have told them what the definition of words are. Uh, and not only that, but just in case you're confused on that, look at verse 37. And what I say unto you, I say only unto the Jew. Watch. Is that what it says? I mean, it rhymes, but that's not what it says. It says, and what I say unto you, I say unto all. Watch, so is this written to just the Jews? Just Israel? Now, that's what people say a lot of times when you just show them something in the Bible and they don't like it. They just say, well, that's the Jews, that's for Israel, that's something else. He's talking to the, 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 the first church there, of which he's the pastor, and he's talking to his 12 disciples. Now, it's funny because just right after this, he's going to have the Last Supper with his disciples, right? And people will say, well, that's a church ordinance because he did that with the church there. Yeah, well, okay, amen. And then when you look at the Great Commission, just a few pages after that, he's talking to the same people, same disciples, and people will say, see, the Great Commission was given unto the church. But all of a sudden, in Matthew 24 and Mark 13, it's the Jews. And Simon the Canaanite, well, he was a Jew too. The Schofield Reference Bible has a note in Matthew 24 where it says that the word elect is referring to Israel. But the Bible defines itself and the Bible gives us the answer to all the questions of doctrines we have. And the word elect, if you study it out in the Bible, simply is not the Jew. Uh, just to give you a quick highlight, in 1 Thessalonians 1.4, it says, Knowing, brethren, beloved, your election of God, talking to the Thessalonians who are clearly Gentiles, we saw it in Romans 8. Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It's God that justified. Out of 16 mentions of the term elect in the Bible, I found 10 re refer to all believers in general. Two of them refer to believers who are specifically Gentiles. One of them refers to believers who are Jews. Two of them refer to Jesus Christ himself. And one refers to Jacob the person as being God's elect. I'll give you one verse that just clearly shows you that the elect does not mean Israel. Because people say the elect, that's Israel, that's the Jews. Okay, Romans 11:7. 7. It says, what then? Israel hath not obtained that which he seeketh for, but the election hath obtained it, and the rest were blinded. So the Bible says, Israel has not, the election has. Well, if Israel were the election, that wouldn't make any sense. And see, throughout Scripture, it's very clear, if you allow the Bible to define itself, that the elect are not the Jews, that the elect is not the nation of Israel, the elect are believers, they can be from Asia Minor, they can be Greek, they can be barbarians, they can be whatever. Hey, if you've put on Christ, if you've put on the new man, you're considered the elect. So when we go back to Matthew 24, and he says, and he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, they shall gather together his elect, that goes perfectly with the passage in regards to the fact that it is the rapture of believers. It has nothing to do with whether they're a Jew or a Gentile, black, white, just elect, as those that are saved. He's gonna gather them up in the clouds with him. Now, I've heard preachers take it even as far as saying that all the events, even up to Matt, or Acts chapter 10, were just to the Jews. So, are you really trying to tell me that the Great Commission in Matthew chapter 28, when Jesus told the whole world, to go preach the gospel, baptize converts, and teach them the things of God, that that was only just to the Jews and he didn't want to see the whole world get saved? That's blasphemy. I've got a list here of every time the word elect's used. We're not gonna go through it because we don't have time. 
but I could go through every time elect's used and I could show you that every single time it's talking about people that are saved. Here's what they'll say, where he says that, you know, the trumpet's going to sound, that Jesus is going to come in the clouds, and he's going to gather together his elect. This is what they'll say. Well, the elect is the Jews. That's not those who are saved. Now, I looked up every single time that the word elect is used in the Bible, every single time. And it's always, 100% of the time, referring to people who are saved. Always. 100% of the time. He said to the Thessalonians, who were Gentiles, he said, you're elect. He said unto uh, the Philippians that they're elect. But look, if you would, at Romans 11. Here's, the, here's a really powerful scripture. It says in verse 7, What then? Israel hath not obtained that which he seeketh for, but the election hath obtained it, and the rest were blinded. Does that look to you like Israel is the elect? Look at that verse. It says that the election did obtain it and Israel didn't. Because the Bible teaches in Romans 8 that the elect are those who are saved. He said, who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justified. If God be for us, who can be against us? We are the elect. He said to the Thessalonians, knowing, brethren, beloved, your election of God. And you can look up every time the word elect and election are used. It's very clear. It's talking about Gentiles half the time. It's talking about Jews half the time. It's just anybody who's saved. Because in Christ, there is neither Jew nor Gentile. There is neither bond nor free. But you're all one in Christ. I actually think one of the most applicable verses in the Bible concerning the election of God is in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, where it says, in verse 4, where Paul speaks to the Thessalonians, knowing, brethren, beloved, your election of God. So we see here that the Thessalonians, that are not Jews, obviously, they're even called the election of God, because the election of God is referring to believers and not the Jews. Now, I really like this reference in the book of Thessalonians, because every single chapter of the book of Thessalonians makes reference to the rapture. And that is key. If Today's Christians understood what the Jews really teach and believe about Jesus Christ. Christians would have a much different perspective of, of the Jewish religion today. It's not what it used to be. And if, you, if they really knew what the Jews really taught and believed about Jesus Christ and all the things that they say about him, they would understand that God is no longer using the Jews as a beacon to reach the world with Jesus Christ. It's just not possible. Judaism stopped being the religion of the Old Testament and began to be the religion of the rabbis and their traditions, or what they call the oral Torah. The Talmud is the holy book of the Jews. It was the oral sayings of the rabbis. It's known as the wisdom of the rabbis. The Talmud is a compilation of all the great discussions that took place from the second century BC until the fifth century CE. It's a kind of encyclopedia right. of Jewish knowledge. The best way of calling it would be the Jewish Wikipedia of the ages. <laughs> yes, because many people participated in it. Right. It's not written by one person. Several hundred hundreds. scholars. Okay. Hundreds of scholars. Hundreds of authors. The Jews have always known throughout history that if Christians knew what was in the Talmud, it would make Christians very angry. And so the Jews were able to conceal a lot of their most blasphemous statements about the Lord Jesus Christ because people didn't speak Hebrew. Here's what they say about Jesus in the Talmud. There's sections in there about Jesus. In fact, there's an entire book that's been written by the director of Judaic studies in Princeton University, Dr. Schaefer, a Jew. He's written a book, Jesus in the Talmud. So if you want to know what Jesus has to do with the Talmud, get his book. Jesus in the Talmud by Dr. Schaefer. Keep in mind that the Talmud was written hundreds of years after Christ lived. And so it has references about Jesus in it, and they are hateful, blasphemous references. According to the Talmud, Jesus was the product of adultery, the bastard son of Mary and a Roman soldier named Pantera. He spent his early life in Egypt, where he learned black magic, idolatry, and sorcery. Jesus was born to a whore. Mary was a whore. She had sexual relations with many men. The father was a Roman centurion. The Talmud further blasphemes the Lord Jesus by calling him a fool 
and comparing him with Old Testament villains such as Balaam, Ahithophel, Doeg, and Gehazi. So from chapter 1 of 1 Thessalonians, we saw that Paul was clearly telling the Thessalonians who were not Jews that they were the elect. So we can see here that the elect is not referring to the Jews. And like I said earlier, the reason why I really like the book of Thessalonians is that every single chapter in 1 and 2 Thessalonians talks about the, the rapture. And actually, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 is another key rapture passage where we can see the exact same events lining up as they did in Matthew chapter 24, Mark chapter 13, Luke chapter 21, and even Revelation chapter 6. We'll start reading in chapter 4, starting in verse 13, where it says, But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. So we see there that we have the same things applying. We have the sun going dark, we have the moon going dark, we have a trumpet sounding, and we have Christ returning in the clouds to gather the elect, which I just showed you were, you know, Bible-believing, born-again, saved Christians, okay? One common objection that people will bring up to the rapture being after the tribulation is they will say that the comfort in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 is referring to the fact that we don't have to go through the horrible events of the tribulation. I mean, we're just going to live in comfort. You know, they take comfort as like a soft pillow or a warm glass of hot cocoa. They don't understand what the word comfort is referring to in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. So we have here 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. And the final says, wherefore comfort one another with these words. Why is it a comfort? Well, it's a comfort to know that Jesus is coming for his bride, the church. And that's why Jesus comes for at the rapture. He comes to take the church, which he calls his bride, out. Well, comfort one another with these words. How could you be comforted if you're waiting for the Antichrist? How could you be comforted if you're waiting for the tribulation? Now, one of the most common objections I get about the rapture passage in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 is that people will say that verse 18 where it says comfort one another with these words, that verse 18 is actually talking about comforting people that you don't have to go through tribulation. Now that's actually not correct and I'll tell you in a minute why uh, Christians have actually always gone through tribulation according to the Bible, but really when he's talking about comforting one another with these words in uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 verse 18, you have to really think about the fact that these verses are always said at funerals, okay? The Bible reads in verse 13, But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. And the reason why it's talked about at a funeral is because if you look at what Paul just got done saying regarding why we're comforting one another with these words, it's the fact that when people have died and they're born again Christians and they've already gone off to be with the Lord, that we should not sorrow over having them leave because it's not just like they're going to die and go to hell or something and we'll never see them again, but rather they're up, they're up in heaven and if we're saved, we're going to go to heaven and when we're caught up in the clouds, if we make it all the way to the rapture, we're going to go to heaven with them and it says that Christ will bring them down to the clouds with him at the rapture, those who are, you know, asleep, or basically people who have already died to be with Christ. So this passage starts out by telling us that we don't have to sorrow as those who have no hope about our loved ones who've died and gone and, and, and are now with the Lord. So the comfort there isn't that you're not going to go through tribulation. I mean, according to the Bible, we've always gone through tribulation. So the comfort there is specifically talking about the fact that we'll see our loved ones again. It has nothing to do with any sort of tribulation. And in fact, if you look at this key rapture passage, 
every single verse refers to the dead in Christ or those who've died and gone to be with the Lord. Verse 13 covered it. Listen to verse 14. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. There it is again. Verse 16. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. There it is again. Verse 17, then we which are alive and remain shall be got up together with them. There it is again. In the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. So in verse 13, he said, I don't want you to mourn like those who have no hope. And then in verse 18, he says, wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Comfort one another about what? About the fact that you've lost a loved one. That's why this passage is popular at funerals, because if you've lost a loved one that was saved, you don't have to mourn like those who have no hope. Why? Because if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. Every verse emphasizes the reunion with those, those loved ones who've died and gone to be with the Lord. So when he says comfort one another with these words, he's not saying, hey, be comforted. There's no persecution coming. There's no tribulation, no trouble. You're gonna be raptured in a moment before anything bad happens, before the Antichrist happens. You're gonna be raptured before that. Isn't that comforting? Doesn't that feel good? No, actually the word comfort, look at the last four letters, fort. That comes from the same root word as our word fortress. Comfort means to strengthen. You know, God wants us to be comforted and strengthened in the knowledge that we will see our loved ones again who've gone to be with the Lord. He didn't say be comforted that you're not going to go through any bad times. That's a ridiculous interpretation of this path. The issue with the pre-tribulation rapture, uh, one, I, one of the biggest mistakes that pre-tribulation rapture believers make is the fact that they take words and they don't allow the Bible to define those words. They allow uh, theologians and they allow uh, people to tell them what those words mean and what happens is they go to the Bible with a preconceived idea in regards to what these words mean. For example, the word tribulation. The New Testament mentions the word tribulation 22 times and the first time it's mentioned is in Matthew 13 uh, when we're reading about the parable of the sower and the Bible tells us in verse 19 it says when anyone heareth the word of the kingdom and understandeth it not then cometh that wicked one and catcheth away that which was sown in his heart that is he which received the seed by the wayside so we see there that they received the seed which is represented by the word of god verse 22 but he that received the seed into stony places the same as he that heareth the word and anon with joy receiveth it so now we have someone receiving the seed verse 21 yet hath not root in himself but dureth for a while and when tribulation or persecution ariseth because of the word by and by he is offended now the interesting thing is when you find the word tribulation mentioned for the first time in the new testament usually the Bible defines for us what these words mean and there we see that it says tribulation or persecution and what the Bible is telling us that word or there is telling us that the word persecution could be put in the place of the word tribulation as it's defining us what the word tribulation means it means persecution it means trouble it means distress and that's what the word tribulation means not the wrath of God not the pouring out of the wrath of God on uh, his people but the fact that people were persecuted because of the word and in this case they were offended. The second time you find the f word tribulation in the New Testament we find that in Matthew 24 21 it says for then shall be great tribulation such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time no nor ever shall be. So the first time we saw it was in Matthew 13 and it was defined for us as persecution. The second time we see it is in Matthew 24 and again if you read through the passage it's telling us that people are going to be delivered up, they're going to be afflicted, they're going to kill you, they're going to hate you uh, for the name of Jesus Christ and then it tells us it refers to this time as great tribulation. So it's consistent in the fact that it's persecution, it's a time of affliction, it's time of great trouble. There's the thing I, point I think we've missed in all of this. There's a difference between tribulation and wrath. Tribulation is what the world does to us. Wrath is what God does to the world. Let me show you the verses on this. Matthew 24. For then shall be great tribulation, such as was not, 
since the beginning of time of the world to this time, no, nor ever shall be. Jesus said in John chapter 16, These things I have spoken unto you, that ye might have peace. In the world ye shall have tribulation. Hmm. Christians for years have been saying, Oh, we're going to get out of here before the tribulation comes. Well, tell that to the Chinese Christians and to the Russian Christians. <laughs> Why should America be spared any persecution? One of the most common verses brought up by those who believe in a pre-tribulation rapture is 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 9, where the Bible says, For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. And this is sort of a mantra amongst those who are pre-trib, you know, not appointed to wrath, we're not appointed to wrath, not appointed to wrath. Well, what's interesting is just two chapters earlier in chapter 3, it says that we are appointed to tribulation. In verse 3, it says that no man should be moved by these afflictions, for yourselves know that we are appointed thereunto. For verily, when we were with you, we told you before that we should suffer tribulation, even as it came to pass, and ye know. Jesus said, we shall have tribulation. I told you before, you should suffer first tribulation. 1 Thessalonians chapter 3. Now Romans 1, 18 tells us the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all these things. Wrath is what God does to the world. I think we're promised pretty clearly, we shall be saved from wrath, Romans chapter 5. So true, we're not appointed to wrath, but chapter 3 says we are appointed to tribulation. The tribulation and the wrath of God are two very different things. Because if it's pre-tribulation rapture, it's already several thousand years too late for an awful lot of Christians. They've already gone through horrible tribulations. <laughs> but nobody has gone through the wrath of God yet. Uh, the wrath of God is for the children of disobedience, it tells us in Ephesians chapter 5. It tells us 2 Timothy, in the last days, perilous times shall come. Things are going to get bad. And the Bible says in 2 Timothy chapter 3, all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. And they try and use that verse and say, see, God would not appoint us to the tribulation. For God hath not appointed us to what? All right. But he did appoint them to wrath. They will be here, so we won't be. The final chapter says yeah. in verse 9, for God has not destined us for wrath the tribulation, see? But we see here in chapter 5, it's not talking about the tribulation, it's talking about God's wrath, which is different from the tribulation. You can't show me one verse in the Bible that equates God pouring out his wrath with the seven trumpets and seven vials. You can't find me a place where God shows that, calls that the tribulation, because it's not the tribulation. And a lot of people, they, they approach this, this question, they approach the Bible with all these preconceived ideas, and they go into it thinking there's a seven-year tribulation. There's no scripture that says the tribulation is seven years, because the only thing he calls the tribulation is everything leading up to the sun and moon being darkened. Everything that happens after the sun and moon being darkened, which is the, the, the turning water into blood, the fire and brimstone, the seven trumpets and seven vials, that's never called tribulation. And in fact, Jesus said that stuff is after the tribulation. The tribulation is something that the world does to us, whereas the wrath is something that God does to the world. Okay, and something that I think is really interesting is that chapter three talks about the tribulation, which it says that we are appointed to as believers. And then chapter four contains the rapture passage. And then chapter five contains God's wrath being poured out on the earth which is a perfect chronology of the events that are going to take place. First you have the tribulation given to everybody, and then after that you have the rapture, and then after the rapture, immediately you have God's wrath being poured out on the earth. Nothing in the description of the tribulation in Matthew 24 has anything to do with God's wrath. It's about people delivering you up to be afflicted, and they shall kill you. You shall be hated of all men for my name's sake, an earthquake. That happens all the time. There was an earthquake yesterday, and the day before that, and the day before that. Literally, there are earthquakes all over the world every day. Okay? All these things are not God's wrath. But when God darkens the sun, when God darkens the moon, when God starts making the stars fall from heaven like a fig tree, that's God's wrath. And when God starts turning water into blood and burning up all the trees and sending locusts out of the pit of hell, to torture people for five months, that is the wrath of God, my friend. 
Is God going to do that to us? No. He's not going to. I've heard Christians a countless number of times use 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 as a means of saying that the day of Lord is somehow going to be some sort of secret rapture where people just wake up one day and wonder where everybody was at. The arrival of Jesus Christ to take his church home is imminent. I believe that uh, literally while we're sitting here talking, the rapture could occur. What do you think? Well, of course, because, yeah, that's what we call the doctrine of eminence. But if you really take time to read the chapter, you'll see that that's not what it's talking about. If you look at verse 1 of 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, you'll see the conjunction being used, but. That means it's talking about the events that had taken place in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, which was the rapture. And Paul's talking to saved believers here when he's, when he's saying this. He says, But of the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I write unto you. For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. For when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them, as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. But ye, brethren, are not in darkness, that that day should overtake you as a thief. Ye are all the children of light and the children of the day. We are not of the night, nor of darkness. Therefore let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. So we see here that the rapture and God's wrath being poured out isn't going to take believers as a thief of the night because believers already know what to expect from the signs. We saw many times in the Bible that we can expect the sun and the moon going dark, we expect a trumpet sounding, and then we can expect Jesus coming in the clouds. So the Bible tells us that he's coming as a thief in the night only to the unsaved, only to those who are in darkness. But those of us who are saved and are children of the light, we are not in darkness that that day should overtake us as a thief. The Bible tells us to watch and be sober. So, no, it's not going to be a secret rapture. It's going to be well known and every eye will see Jesus Christ when he comes in the clouds on that day. Now the pre-tribbers will tell you there are no signs of his coming. He could come at any moment. He could come before the service is over. The next event on God's prophetic calendar is the rapture. The absence of any instruction or warning to the church about the tribulation. You would think if we were going to go through that, there would be instruction in the Bible about what we are to look forward to. But there isn't anything. Well, first of all, the Bible says nothing about preparing for the tribulation. Well, if there are no signs of His coming, then why does the Bible say that we should be watching? Watching for what? But here's what's funny. If you actually go to that passage where it says that uh, he's coming as a thief in the night in 1 Thessalonians 5, if you go down two verses, it says, but ye, brethren, are not in darkness, that that day should overtake you as a thief. Ye are all the children of the light and the children of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. It's saying the dumbed down masses won't know what hit them. Exactly. He says that it's coming upon those that do not believe, those who don't know. The we light. all know it's coming. We all see the freight train. Why would it come upon us as a thief in the night when he's telling us exactly what's going to happen? He says, you're not in darkness that that day should overtake you. Totally clear. Totally clear. Exactly. That's it's why you got to stop listening to preachers and read the Bible. Uh, as I looked at it, as the, the second coming of Christ, it, 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 it's sort of like a Hollywood entrance. It won't impress people. Hey, look at me, okay? If, if you read Revelation chapter 6 or Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke 21, any of the passages that describe the sun and the moon going dark, which is going to get just about everybody's attention on earth. But it also says there's an earthquake. So in case you're blind, it is still going to get your attention. And the stars fall from heaven. And in the midst of this total darkness, the earthquake, and the stars falling from heaven, then the Lord appears. Everybody's going to go, wow, this was Jesus. Every eye shall see and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And this is when the rich people and the, the, the mighty men of the world in Revelation chapter 6 are going to weep and mourn and say, oh, we missed it. That was the one. So I think the idea that there's going to be a secret second coming where, you know, people have to later find out what happened is just not true. Everybody's going to get everybody's attention with this grand Hollywood open. Yeah, you're exactly right. And in Revelation chapter 1, it says, behold, he cometh with clouds and every eye shall see him. And, and notice the cometh is in present tense. I mean, that's, that's the next time he comes. He's coming with clouds and every eye shall see him. So it's pretty clear. And it all is, is relying upon one key point, 
that they teach that Jesus can come back at any moment. And you know, you'll hear a lot of TV preachers saying, you know, he may even come back before I'm done with this sermon. Come like a thief in the night, no man know the time. Right. Send, you know, send your money now, you know, you don't need it. It's a, you, we could be gone tomorrow. Does the Bible indicate that it's possible for the Lord Jesus to return even today to rapture his bride, the church, out of the world? I'm convinced that it does indicate that. The early church Christians believed Jesus could come back any moment. So this doctrine that says that Jesus is coming at any moment is not found in scripture at all. And what they're twisting is where Jesus Christ said in Matthew 24, of that day and hour, he said, but of that day and hour knoweth no man, know not the angels of heaven. Well, what they forgot to tell you is that a couple of verses before that, he said,